The first boats were not made by Homo sapiens. Evidence shows several hominin groups launched from rocky Mediterranean coasts, tangled jungles of Southeast Asia, and into seemingly endless ocean horizons. Stone hand axes and flake tools have been found on islands that have been cut off from continents for millions of years. And there are DNA traces of prehistoric voyages that could rewrite our understanding of human history. These discoveries suggest that the very first shipbuilders might have been Homo erectus or Neanderthals, not modern humans. As Boston University archaeologist Curtis Runnell said, the idea of finding such ancient tools on Crete was, quote, about as believable as finding an iPod in King Tut's tomb. Yet piles of Oldowan and Archelaean tools on windswept beaches are forcing a rewriting of this history. The art of boat building and seamanship predates our own species. Earliest evidence, boats older than Homo sapiens. For decades, the conventional timeline held that the first humans to strike out across the oceans were our own species, arriving in Australia about 50,000 to 60,000 years ago. But recent finds have pushed seafaring back into the deep past. On the island of Crete, Greek archaeologist Thomas Strasser and his colleagues have uncovered dozens of hand axes and cleavers in Pleistocene beach deposits. These tools, dating back at least 130,000 years ago, could only have arrived by sea. Crete has been an isolated island for at least 5 million years. The style of the stone tools is telling. They resemble Archelaean bifaces used by Homo erectus and later Neanderthals. In Strasser's words, these ancient mariners were, quote, intentional seafarers, not individuals lost at sea. Similarly, Mausterian stone flakes and hand axes have been found on other Aegean islands, like Naxos, Zakynthos, and Kefalonia, all places unreachable without boats. This suggests that by at least 130,000 years ago, archaic humans were island hopping in the Mediterranean, tens of thousands of years before Homo sapiens ever entered the region. Even older evidence comes from Southeast Asia. In 2010, Broom and colleagues reported that stone artifacts from Flora's Island in Indonesia are dated to about 1.02 million years ago, the Wolo Sege site, and roughly 800 to 880,000 years ago at the Matamengi site. Flores lies deep in the ocean, and the only hominin known there that long ago was the dwarf form of Homo erectus, later nicknamed the Hobbit. To reach Flores, those early humans must have crossed open water. Michael Morewood, the archaeologist who discovered Flores' hominin remains, long proposed that Homo erectus voyaged by raft or dugout canoe from Bali to Flores, carrying with them flint tools that now date back to 700,000 to 800,000 years ago. In Africa, too, the pattern hints at prehistoric voyages. The Dominici site in Georgia, about 1.8 million years ago, required crossing water barriers at the Red Sea region, and stone tools found in Spain over a million years old hint that early humans may have crossed the Strait of Gibraltar from Morocco. It might seem odd at first, how could ancient humans need boats if they were migrating during an ice age, when sea levels were far lower than today, wouldn't everything just be connected by dry land? But even during the most intense ice ages, when vast glaciers locked away much of Earth's water and sea levels fell by up to 120 meters, or about 400 feet, some water barriers never disappeared. Certain critical choke points, narrow seas like the Red Sea and the Strait of Gibraltar, remained uncrossable by foot. And yet astonishingly, there was ever-growing evidence to suggest that humans crossed them anyway. Around 1.8 million years ago, early Homo erectus and their relatives began leaving Africa. Archaeological traces appear soon after in the Caucasus Mountains at Damanasi, Georgia, a windswept site littered with ancient skulls and hand axes. But to leave Africa and head toward Eurasia, migrants would have faced a watery obstacle, the Red Sea. At the narrowest point today, the Bab el-Mandeb Strait, Africa and Arabia are separated by about 30 kilometers or 19 miles of ocean. During glacial periods, the strait would have shrunk, exposing some land bridges and lowering the water gap to around 4 to 8 kilometers, about 2 to 5 miles across. So even though it wasn't as wide, there was always water here, it was never completely dry. Even at the lowest sea levels, a strip of deep water remained between Africa and Arabia. Thus, if early Homo erectus left via the Bab el Mandeb route, they still needed to raft, swim, or ferry themselves across some kind of sea showing pure desperation or an adventurous spirit, maybe a bit of both, as these currents were dangerous even back then, and there would have been no mistaking the leap of faith it required to set out onto open water with no guarantee of land beyond the horizon. Of course, no rafts survived from this age, but their footprints in Dominici show that they succeeded. 
They may have built rudimentary rafts from fallen trees, vines, or bundles of reeds, simple but sufficient to float across short channels when the tide was calm. Perhaps groups clung together atop driftwood or lashed reeds and brush to form floating mats. However it was done, it speaks to the daring spirit of exploration that was deeply embedded in even our most ancient ancestors, around two million years ago. Now you might be thinking if ancient humans wanted to leave Africa, why risk a dangerous sea crossing at the Baba Mandeb Strait? Why not simply walk north, through the Levant, going through Egypt and into the Sinai, across the Middle East? After all, today that's a land route. And there's something to this, later migrations of Homo sapiens did take that exact route. The Levantine Corridor is famously the main land bridge out of Africa from around 100,000 to 60,000 years ago. But the earliest migrations, the ones we're talking about with Homo erectus nearly 1.8 million years ago, things were very different. Here's why. Around 1.8 million years ago, the world was in the grip of the Pleistocene Ice Age fluctuations. The Sahara Desert was vast, hot, and largely inimical to life, even bigger and harsher than today during certain periods. The Sahara wasn't just a desert, it was often a nearly unbroken, hyper-arid wasteland, a true barrier to northward movement. What are called Green Sahara periods, where the desert was lush, did happen, but they were cyclical and rare in the early Pleistocene. At the time when we're talking about, around 1.8 million years ago, no reliable green corridor through North Africa was available yet, and so there was no easy route for migration to the Levant. And you cannot just follow the Nile up, since the Nile River as we know it today, a continuous, lush artery stretching from the heart of Africa to the Mediterranean, did not exist in its modern form 2 million years ago. The integrated Nile system, with a single river connecting the Ethiopian highlands, Sudan, and Egypt, is relatively recent, perhaps only fully established in the last 800,000 years. So for Homo erectus, it was at least still a million years away. Back then, the Nile consisted of separate river segments, small rivers from Ethiopia draining north, ancient tributaries in Sudan and Egypt, in periods of intense desertification, causing huge parts of the Nile's course to dry up, fragment, or form disconnected basins. In fact, there were likely long stretches where the Nile vanished into dry plains, creating desert barriers hundreds of kilometers wide. So the bottom line is early humans could not simply walk along the Nile, because at many times it wasn't a continuous river, it was broken, seasonal, and unreliable. But what about moving up the Red Sea coastline? Staying near the ocean, fishing and gathering shellfish, slowly creeping up north. This was more feasible, but it came with its own serious hazards. The African side of the Red Sea, modern-day Eritrea, Sudan, and Egypt, is marked by rugged mountains, cliffs, and narrow, rocky coastal strips. In many places, the coastline is sharply broken by steep escarpments and dry riverbeds or wadis that cut deep into the terrain. Food and freshwater sources would have been extremely patchy. Maybe some fertile wadis and oases, but there would be unpredictable, long, barren stretches in between. Essentially, it would be like inching forward along a narrow, broken, often deadly coastal path exposed to intense heat, sun, and thirst. So while it's technically possible that some groups could attempt this strategy, the risk of getting trapped or dying between freshwater sources would have been extremely high. And crucially to the point of this video, even after surviving this journey, they would have still faced water crossings at the top of the Red Sea or along the Gulf of Suez, because the land was never fully continuous. Instead, at best, it consisted of marshy, muddy terrain and in some areas remained covered by shallow seawaters. This means that early hominids attempting to migrate from Africa to the Levant via this northern route would have still encountered water barriers, making the journey impossible without some form of watercraft or means to traverse these obstacles. Meaning that no matter which route they took, they still end up having to develop some sort of watercraft. And so experts in this field do not think this was the route taken. Walking through Egypt and into the Middle East would have required crossing hundreds of miles of deadly desert with virtually no water or food sources. And the east coast of Africa was also treacherous and still ends up with some sort of water crossing. This southern route was easier for early hominids. Instead of following the African coast or a non-existent Nile, Early humans followed what scientists call the Southern Dispersal Route, hugging the coastal edges of the Red Sea. Along the Southern Arabian coastline, there would have been freshwater springs, fish, shellfish, and manageable temperatures. Coastal ecosystems are rich in food and less vulnerable to sudden droughts. These ancient coastlines offered stable and predictable survival zones that desert interiors did not. Thus, early humans moving along the coast would have reached the Bab el-Mandeb Strait 
at the southern tip of the Red Sea. And here, even though it required a water crossing, it was the shortest, most survivable option compared to dying of thirst in the Saharan interior or trying to walk up the east coast. But now let's look at Gibraltar. The Strait of Gibraltar, the fabled Pillars of Hercules in ancient lore, present another case where water never fully withdrew. Today, Gibraltar is about 13 kilometers or 8 miles across at its narrowest point. During glacial maximums, when sea levels plunged, the strait narrowed dramatically. Some estimates suggest that in Ice Age conditions, the distance shrank to as little as 5 kilometers or 3 miles. But the currents between the Atlantic and Mediterranean would have raged even harder through this tighter gap creating a dangerous torrent. Yet across that turbulent strait, in southern Spain and coastal Morocco, archaeologists have found nearly identical stone tool industries, notably Archelaean hand axes and level wall flakes, dating back over one million years. It suggests something remarkable. Ancient hominins, likely Homo erectus or early Homo heidelbergensis, were able to make this dangerous crossing. Crossing the Strait of Gibraltar would have been terrifying. The current is strong even for modern swimmers, and tides swirl unpredictably. A simple log raft might have been swept far from sight of land. To survive, these early voyagers must have watched the tides carefully, choosing moments when the seas were calmer, much like Pacific Islanders millennia later would learn to read the oceans by its swells, colors, and cloud reflections. But the reward for success was tremendous. A new continent. Europe, a land full of untapped forests, rivers, and game, was a green dream on the other side of this three-mile strait. And those who dared to cross could carve out entirely new lives there, far from their African birthplace. And again, it's nearly impossible that any of the boats from this time would survive. By comparison, the oldest physical boat we have actually found is astonishingly young. The Pesce Canoe of the Neanderthals, carved out from a single pine log, and dated to about 8040 to 7510 BC, during the Mesolithic era. This dugout canoe, now preserved in a museum, proves that by the late Stone Age, Homo sapiens were building watercraft, but the gap between something 10,000 years old to 100,000 or a million years is just too long of a stretch for organic materials like wood and whatever rope they use to survive. The fact that it's long been known that there's been travel for at least 100,000 years by Homo sapiens, and yet the oldest surviving boat we have is only 10,000 years ago, really highlights the point that nobody expects to find any surviving rafts from 2 million years ago. But by looking at the evidence that does survive in these different sites, we can deduce a lot about these people. The fact that these straits were too large and too turbulent to just be simple rafts or accidental drifting, it had to be deliberately invented watercraft, and this suggests advanced planning and perhaps even rudimentary language. As linguist Daniel Everett speculated, if Homo erectus paddled rafts to Flores, they would have needed some sort of way to say paddle here or stop, some way to coordinate with the crew, and so there had to be some form of proto-language here. So while there's heavy debate on the whole theory of mind aspect of Homo erectus, what exactly do we call language? What's absolutely certain is that their presence on remote islands by 800,000 years ago proved that they are amongst the earliest mariners. Later, in the middle Pleistocene, the species Homo heidelbergensis, the common ancestor of Neanderthals and modern humans, also are believed to have taken to the seas. The hand axes on Crete have been attributed by some to heidelbergensis grade hominins. This means humans related to Neanderthals might have been island hopping in the Mediterranean hundreds of millennia ago. And eventually, Homo neanderthalus itself emerges as a strong candidate, with Neanderthals occupying Europe from about 400,000 years ago until about 30,000 years ago. And their unique Mosterian stone toolkit has been found on several Mediterranean islands. Archaeologist Alan Simmons noted that this data, quote, suggests that the urge to go to sea predates modern humans. And even skeptics like Brown University's John Cherry have come to accept the fact that we may now have, quote, seafaring Neanderthals, ancient mariners in the Mediterranean long before the Egyptians and Greeks. In short, multiple species took part. Early Homo erectus or a sister lineage built crude rafts or dugouts to reach Flores a million years ago. Half a million years later, their descendants or relatives like Heidelbergensis were crossing the Mediterranean to Crete. And finally, Neanderthals were island hopping across Aegean waters by about 100,000 years ago. So by the time Homo sapiens appeared, roughly around 300,000 years ago, we would have been exposed to these older groups, and with integration, we would have also inherited a long maritime legacy. Even the tiny hobbit, Homo forensis, which was found on Flores in the late Pleistocene, must have ancestors who crossed open water. 
And so while of course we can't say who were the very first shipbuilders, we can be sure that this technology emerged before Homo sapiens did. And importantly, it wasn't just a one-time thing. As archaeologist Runnels said about Crete, having so many artifacts in so many places across this island, quote, suggests that a large enough number of people came in order to sustain populations, and they didn't just raft over once. In other words, in the archaeological record, though we can't see their actual ships, everything is implying purposeful voyages in a boat-building society, which was all kicked off nearly two million years ago. We can even infer what these ancient boats look like. We have to imagine by analogy, since wooden craft leave little trace, but most likely the early boats were very simple. One candidate is the dugout canoe, a single log hollowed out. Across the world, cultures built dugouts by controlled burning and scraping. Ethnographic and experimental studies describe this technique, where a tree trunk's bark could be removed, the hot embers placed along its length to burn the interior wood. And after charring, stone tools would scoop out the charcoal, gradually hollowing the log. Repeated burning and chopping transforms the tree into a buoyant canoe. This is exactly how the Pesce canoe was carved 10 millennia ago, and it's likely that our hominin ancestors, who also had stone tools and could create and control fire, would have also independently invented this same technology. There's also the idea of a raft, where bundles of reeds or logs are tied together, and these rafts would leave even less evidence archaeologically. But we do know ancient people wove ropes and mats. But again, it's all plant or animal material. It's plausible that early mariners lashed logs with vines or hides to carry them to sea. And in warmer regions, papyrus and bamboo shoots were common. They're simple rafts used by people even today. As time went on, innovations followed. The outrigged canoe, a log with one or two bamboo floats tied alongside, would give even more stability on turbulent seas. And these designs persisted into recorded history in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Stone Age sailors may have fitted logs this way when crossing larger canals. And so in these vastly different sites across the world, over hundreds of thousands of years apart, they're all working with the same toolkit and end up inventing similar techniques. Flint axes and chisels would shape wood and carve paddles, and even simpler, steering could have just been done with branches or poles. It was all well within the hominin toolkit. Why they traveled may be as simple as calories or environmental change. In practical terms, a group of hunters or gatherers might push into the unknown to follow migrating game, escape harsh conditions, or tap unexploited seafood beds. Strasser's team argues that the Crete settlers were not castaways but intentional colonists, with enough people making the trip that they formed a breeding population on the island. And these routes are very difficult. To reach Crete from mainland Greece or Turkey at glacial low sea levels required at least three separate crossings of 19 to 39 kilometers each. Leaving from Africa would have meant a single span of over 200 kilometers over open ocean. Likewise, a voyage from Bali to Flores traverses strong currents and at least 16 kilometers of water, and what's most likely is that they're hugging the coast and island hopping. But it needs to be stressed that there would be large stretches where they could not see any land. And of course, this tradition would become a part of the human spirit. From Erectus to Florensis to Neanderthal and Homo sapien, this technology is developed over each generation. Out in the Pacific, there's the later Polynesians who navigated thousands of miles with stellar navigation, and they have a direct lineage to these early pioneers. Thanks to these ancient crossings, humans spread to every corner of the globe. When Homo sapiens made it to Australia, they had to navigate a 970-kilometer band of islands and ocean straits, the largest at 71 kilometers of open sea, and Erectus's crossing to Flores faced one of the largest ocean currents on Earth. Each island settlement from Flores to Crete to Australia stands as a testament to the courage and creativity of these early boat builders and how the wider net of hominin influences, not just Homo sapiens, all influence what we think of today as the modern Homo sapien. Quote, every textbook may have to be rewritten, says Runnels of the Crete Discoveries. The legacy of seafaring underlies the immense voyages that shaped our world, from the Polynesian catamarans to the Norse longships to today's global shipping lanes. It also reminds us that curiosity and ingenuity are deeply human traits, and that we should expand what we think of as human to include Neanderthal, Homo erectus, and many other now extinct cousins that had an influence not just in our genetics, but in our technology and culture. So maritime technology did not originate with Egypt or Mesopotamia, not even with Homo sapiens, but of a broader hominin human spirit that was brave enough to strike out across the seas.